Academia has hope. Behavioral science has hope. The way that research is published has hope. That's the message I want to convey in today's video. And that's because recently on this channel we've talked a lot about the worst of my field. Namely, Francesca Gino, a top professor at Harvard University who's been accused of some of the most egregious cases of data fraud we've ever seen. Now, this story was extremely distressing for everyone in the behavioral science industry, and I've given you my take as someone who is a behavioral science practitioner, someone who applies behavioral science in the real world. But I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to hear the take of someone who was affected by this scandal even more directly than I. And that is another top professor of behavioral science. And that's where today's guest comes in. My guest today is Professor Katie Milkmoon. If you don't know who she is, she's a top professor of behavioral science at Wharton. She's also the author of the best-selling book, How to Change, which I strongly recommend you go and read. And she's the host of one of my favorite podcasts on behavioral science called Choiceology. I've talked about her research extensively on this channel before, but the reason why I wanted to talk to her about this scandal specifically is because if I had to put my money on one academic never having a scandal like this come out about them, it would be Katie Milkman. To me, if Francesca Gino is the reverse flash, Katie Milkman is the flash. And hopefully in this video, you'll see why. So the first question I asked Katie was, how has the Francesca Gino story affected her as one of the world's leading behavioral scientists? Um, first, thank you for calling me a leading behavioral scientist. I am honored by that designation. <laughs> uh, you know, second, I would say that uh, any time there is an allegation of researcher misconduct, it leads everyone else in the field to start thinking, you know, how can we change the way that we operate in order to make sure that there are more safeguards to prevent what is alleged to have happened from happening. So I've been having a lot of conversations with people about what we could do to ensure that when someone publishes a manuscript with data in it, that data has been verified in some way. Currently, we upload a file and the researcher could you know, create the file on their desktop and Excel. They could make up every number in it and there, there's no actual way we are validating that's not what's happened. Now, I'm not going to say that I think that that's what normally happens. I think most of the time people are doing exactly what they say they're doing, which is collecting data in a database and then uploading it. But we don't have protections in place and it's always better to prevent rather than to try to identify issues. So obviously this is not a very secure system that we have in place right now. It relies a lot on good faith, on trust, and well, that's just not a very secure system. It's a big red flag for me. Currently my day job is working in internal audit at one of the UK's major banks. And if a bank had a system like this, well, that would be an immediate red flag. It would never fly in the financial sector. But somehow this very weak security system has managed to persist in academia for a long time. Thankfully though, some academics are trying to put in controls to make this system more robust. As Katie Milkman explains here. So one thing that's going on is that um, folks are in touch with Qualtrics, which is a major data collection engine for behavioral science researchers to see if we might be able to create some sort of validation system whereby a researcher could upload both a data file and some sort of confirmation that it matches. You might want to take out identifiable information, of course. In fact, you would be ethically obligated to do so, but you might want to say, you know, the 10 columns I've uploaded match 10 columns in the original data. Now there are 20 columns I deleted from the original data because they provide identifiable characteristics of the participants, but the 10 columns I have shared, they're valid. So that's something we could definitely make possible. And we could do things like put badges on published papers that have done such a thing, just as we now put badges on papers that are pre-registered. Now this certainly sounds promising. After all, a good chunk of studies in behavioral science and psychology do use Qualtrics or a service very similar to it. But of course, not all experiments use Qualtrics. Field studies, for example, wouldn't be able to rely on a system like this. So in the case of a field study, Katie suggested that if an academic works with a third party firm, then that third party firm should hold on to the data that that academic was using in their study. For example, if an academic worked with the bank, for example, to see how a particular behavioral intervention maybe affected people's ability to pay off their mortgages, then that bank data that the academic used to test his or her hypothesis should be stored by the bank. So that when that academic submits their paper for publishing by a journal, then if needed, the journal can ask the bank to provide that original data that they provided to the academic so that they can compare the two data sets. Now you may have caught at the end there, Katie mentioned something called pre-registration. So in case you don't know what that means, here's Katie explaining. You mentioned pre-registration there for people watching who don't know what that means. Can you explain what that is? Yes. One thing that I think has been a big improvement in our field over the last 
roughly 15 years is a move towards saying in advance of data collection exactly what analyses you plan to run. And what this does is it protects against a researcher who goes into a study and they have a hypothesis that you know, getting people to jump up and down three times will lead them to be, you know, more self-controlled in the future. Hopefully no one ever does a study that's that silly, but imagine that's your hypothesis. So I collect data, I randomly assign people to jump up and down three times or not, and then I collect um, information about their self-control strength, maybe based on some sort of scale measure. And if I haven't pre-registered and then I get the data, I might find, oh shoot, my hypothesis isn't quite supported by the data, but actually, if I just control for the participant's age and I drop all of the people who didn't brush their teeth this morning, it looks like it, my hypothesis is true. So let me publish that. So that's what pre-registration is. And personally, I'm a big fan. While it isn't a perfect system for catching data fraud, for example, it wouldn't catch the type of data fraud that Francesca Gino is accused of, which is just making up data out of thin air. It does help prevent against an even more common type of academic fraud, which is called p-hacking, which is the name that's generally given to the type of fraud that Katie Milkwin just described. P-hacking is when you chop up the data in a way to try and get a statistically significant result, when in reality you shouldn't have one. And the reason why academics are incentivized to do p-hacking is because they know that studies that they run that don't produce statistically significant results are significantly less likely to be published in a top journal. But pre-registration isn't the only way that academia has taken a step forward to being more robust in recent years. Another technique that Katie Milkman has been a key pioneer of is a technique called mega studies. So here's Katie explaining mega studies. So what is a mega study and why does it help make behavioral science more robust? Thanks for asking my favorite question. So mega studies are massive collaborative projects where we run a field experiment with a partner organization targeting a certain outcome of interest, say, uh, trying to get more people vaccinated. That would be an example of something we have run mega studies on. Instead of just testing my hypothesis, we would actually go out to a team that might include dozens of different researchers, get each of them to propose a study design to test different hypotheses. And then we'd pool them all in a single mega study. So it's like many, many islands, many studies, they're all being launched simultaneously with the same outcome variable by the same team on the same timeline. So just to flesh out Katie's explanation with an example, this is actually Katie's mega study that she did. As you can see, there are like 40 different co-authors on this study and they're all on screen now for you to see. This study was looking at whether text messages can encourage people to show up for the vaccine appointment. Now, of course, this research was encouraged by COVID-19, but these text messages weren't encouraging people to get the COVID-19 vaccine per se. They were actually encouraging people to just get the normal flu vaccine. So the way this mega study worked is that, you know, these 40 different co-authors formed different teams and each of these teams proposed their own hypotheses for how those different text messages should be worded. So as you can see here, there are loads of different types of text message types and ideas that were tested and these are all tested at the same time which is kind of the benefit of the mega study that they can test all of these things at the same time in the same context with the same you know uh, population whereas a normal study would only be looking at like one or two of these things at most now in order to pull off a study of this size and test so many different hypotheses and still have statistical significance you need an absolutely enormous sample size but because these researchers were collaborating with Walmart Pharmacy, they were able to get a sample size of 680,000 patients, which is an absolutely bonkers number of people to take part in a study. And well, this study produced some pretty interesting results. I would say the, the big takeaways from that work is that sending reminder messages, encouraging people to go and get a vaccine has real returns and that um, we can slightly improve upon the returns of a simple reminder by using behaviorally informed messaging. Um, repeated messages are better than a single message, which some people would think, oh, nagging is annoying, but actually it seems pretty clear that it's helpful. Uh, and then um, the, the sort of language that seemed to perform the best in two different mega studies was language that talked about um, a vaccine that was waiting for you or reserved for you. So it, it uses the idea of ownership we think this is probably related to research that's been done before on the endowment effect. Richard Thaler and colleagues uh, have shown that when someone feels they have ownership over something, that it belongs to them, they, they overvalue it, they value it more. So if we tell you a vaccine is waiting for you or reserved for you, that presumably conveys a sense that this is mine and so we may overvalue it. So those were exciting results for mega studies. And we also sh showed a lot of things that didn't work as well as we hoped. One sad, disappointing result was that 
humor actually really didn't seem to work. I thought humor and vaccines might be great. We said, you know, have you heard the one about the flu? Don't spread it around. We thought maybe people would get a little laugh out of that. Maybe they'd repeat it to someone else that would embed the plan to get a flu shot more firmly in memory really was not effective. So there are a number of duds along those lines, but it's helpful in a mega study not only to rule in some things that look useful, but also to be able to say what underperformed expectations. Now, mega studies like this not only produce cool results, but they also go a long way to improving the robustness of that research. And here's Katie explaining why. This does a bunch of things that I think are exciting. One thing it does is it allows us to make apples to apples comparisons between the policy val value of different approaches to solving the same policy problem. So if I have one idea, an economist has another idea, a psychologist has a third idea, and we test them all, we can think about the cost benefit in a reasonable way by comparing the results. But another important thing it does actually is it um, imposes on us a common structure in terms of data collection, data sharing. We as a, a centralized organizer at the Behavior Change for Good Initiative at the University of Pennsylvania, um, we pre-register our research and, and ask that everyone else who's participating in a mega study, if they have an independent component of that study and a, an independent hypothesis they want to test within it that they pre-register to. We also publish the full results so that every single one of the studies that's included will end up being published. One thing that happens in, in science is often you run a study, the result isn't what you hoped, and you put it in what's called, we call it the file drawer. You, you're like, well, shucks, that's not worth writing up. No good journal will really want to see my null because there's many reasons that a study can fail. Maybe I designed it badly. So there's a lot of, there's reason that we don't see the top journals publishing good studies, but it disincentivizes researchers from getting that evidence of a, a failed study out there. And when we do these mega studies, we can actually pull all the results and, and sort of the exciting stuff comes along with the, the failures and it all gets published. So that's helpful in terms of giving people a better understanding of what's real and what's not replicable. Another thing it does in terms of this idea of sort of data fraud is there's a centralized organizing system. There's a team that's overseeing data collection. Many people are looking and checking. And so no individual study could easily be made into a fraud because it's part of the centralized effort. So in that sense, I think um, it's helpful. I, it, it, I, don't, I don't even know how someone who's participating in this could attempt fraud. Um, those are a number of things that are exciting about mega studies. I think there's more too, but but in terms of the robustness of science, I think those are the big benefits. So hopefully my conversation with Katie Milkman has restored some faith in behavioral science for you. Not everybody in the industry is a fraudster. Most people are doing good work and academics are working really hard in response to the case with Francesca Gino in order to make behavioral science more robust. Now, before we go, I just want to tell you one of the reasons why I admire Katie Milkman so much is that even though she's the one that tends to get a lot of the limelight as the lead author on all of these cool studies, she always takes the time to give credit to her co-authors. So out of respect for that and to her practice of giving them credit, here's her doing just that. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. And I actually also, while I have an opportunity, would love to shout out the awesome teams that um, helped develop the Reserve for You language. I just want to say um, Gretchen Chapman and Alison Buttenheim. Um, in particular, and then uh, Noah Goldstein, John Bogart, and Craig Fox were seminal in, in thinking about that ownership language and making sure it was deployed. What a legend. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Katie, for doing this interview with me, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.